Right now on Morning News Now, a new co-defendant summoned to the court in the classified documents case involving Donald Trump. This morning, a little-known property manager at Mar-a-Lago is set to appear before a judge as the defiant former president rallies his supporters on the campaign trail. It's a great badge of honor because I'm being indicted for you. We have team coverage with the latest. Also this morning, a desperate search for an American woman and her child believed to have been abducted in Haiti as gang violence and political unrest plagues the island nation. What we're learning about where they were last seen and the warning now from federal officials. Plus, fueling the fire this morning, tens of millions of Americans are waking up to heat alerts on this final day of July. And now drivers are seeing the side effects of this sweltering summer. How the record-breaking temperatures are impacting the price you pay at the pump. And cash or credit? It's the big question for last-minute summer travelers. Should you use your hard-earned points to book your next vacay, or is it better to save them for later? We'll explain how to get the most out of those rewards. I use them when I've got them, but I don't know if that's the right thing to think to do. I only use them for travel, so I, this is a great segment. Yeah, I know. It is a good one. And, and when you're like, should I save it up for I that know. farther trip for something international? They expire so many questions. Exactly. <laughs> good morning, everybody. I'm Lindsay Reiser in for Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Let's get to our top story. One of the defendants in the Mar-a-Lago documents case is set to appear in court today. Prosecutors allege Mar-a-Lago employee Carlos de Oliveira worked with former President Donald Trump in an an attempt to delete surveillance footage from the Florida club after the Justice Department asked to see it. It's unclear whether he was successful in destroying the footage. De Oliveira is expected to appear in court today to submit his plea before a judge. He was added to the indictment last week, nearly two months after Trump pleaded not guilty to the charges brought on by special counsel Jack Smith. De Oliveira faces charges that include conspiracy to obstruct justice and lying to investigators. We have a team covering it all, including NBC's Ken Delanian and legal analyst Danny Savalas. But we're going to go ahead and begin with NBC's Katie Fang outside the courthouse in Florida. So, Katie, good morning. What can we expect to see in court this morning? Well, we should be able to expect to see Carlos de Oliveira himself. His actual image has been a little bit elusive for most of us. We've been trying to figure out what this guy looks like, but he should be showing up with who we think is his current counsel, John Irving, who very pointedly is not barred to practice law in the Southern District of Florida at this time. But when he appears before the chief magistrate judge, Edwin Torres, this morning at 1030, right behind me at this courthouse, he's going to be read the charges, and then he's going to be given the opportunity to enter a plea. But here's the big caveat. As we saw happen with his co-defendant, Walt Nauta, at least a couple of times, this arraignment, meaning his ability to enter his plea, may be reset a couple of times if he doesn't have local counsel who is able to practice in the Southern District of Florida. Ken, let's bring you in here. The legal bills for both De Oliveira and Nada are being covered by this political action committee that's connected to Trump. And according to The Washington Post, that PAC has already spent $40 million or so on these legal battles so far this year. What are we learning about those bills, a request for a refund, and any type of conflict of interest here? Yeah, that's right, Savannah. The New York Times is reporting that that PAC has requested a refund on an enormous contribution made to another political organization supporting Donald Trump's candidacy. And that just suggests the amount of pressure that is on the finances of this fundraising operation to pay for these legal bills. The Times is also reporting that now 10 cents out of every dollar that Donald Trump is raising for his presidential campaign is going to pay his legal bills and that of his co-defendants. And that's really important, and it's starting to raise questions about conflicts of interest. These two lower-level Trump employees, Walt Nauta and Carlos de Oliveira, both of their lawyers are being paid for out of Donald Trump's political action committee. And these are both men that, should they decide to cooperate with prosecutors, according to the indictment, would have a lot of damaging things to say about Donald Trump. But right now, they're not saying them. They are co-defendants, and they're facing years in prison on these charges. So, Danny, we know that Nada's hearings were delayed because of a lack of local counsel. We just heard Katie say that we could see something similar here with De Oliveira's case. 
Yeah, this is a sign that high-profile cases follow different rules than regular run-of-the-mill mm. cases, and mm. here's why. Uh, the arraignment is an important date, but it is really just uh, substantively not a whole lot goes on. Yes, it kicks off the clock for speedy trial purposes. It's the formal beginning of the case, but it's pretty routine in state and federal court to just have the federal public defender or the public defender just stand in on the arraignment. Because when you think about it, an arraignment happens two or three, maybe four days after an indictment. Nobody has the time to go out and hire private counsel by then unless they have a ton of capital laying around. So it's often the case that the defendant, the attorney who represents at the arraignment is not the attorney who will represent the defendant at trial. So it is interesting to me that we're seeing these delays of several weeks for defendants to get counsel. You can imagine a system if a defendant was allowed to indefinitely postpone the arraignment by saying, hey, judge, I don't have a lawyer yet, believe me, Defendants do that all the time. They use the I'm hiring a lawyer, and judges are trained to kind of look through that. Well, how far along are you in this process? Mm. Who have, have you actually talked to anyone? When are you going? Well, I'll give you two weeks to come back and see if you've hired someone. But if not, we got to go forward with this mm. hearing. Ken, uh, let's come back to you now and take a closer look at some of what's in this indictment here, including I specifically want you to walk us through employee number four. Who is that? Is that person cooperating? How much of a concern is this for the former president? NBC News reporting has identified him as Yusil Tavares, and he is uh, an IT employee, we believe, at Mar-a-Lago. And it appears from this indictment that he is cooperating with authorities because he's quoted uh, essentially describing a conversation between him and Carlos de Oliveira, where he says, I think these words will become infamous, the boss wants the footage deleted. Uh, now, it's not clear that they actually deleted the footage, but this is now part of a this new set of charges in this indictment charging Donald Trump and these two co-defendants with conspiracy to obstruct justice, uh, to wit, de deleting this surveillance footage that was under subpoena. And it, if, if true, this really undermines Donald Trump's defense, which is that, you know, there was nothing amiss here. He had every right to have these documents, they may have declassified them. Why would he? Why would he then try to destroy evidence of the boxes being moved on this surveillance video? This is a big deal. It's a big new front in this case. So, Katie, what happens next? Not only for De Oliveira after this initial court appearance, but what happens next in this case at large? Well, assuming arguendo, we get this guy arraigned. What he ends up doing is he ends up being a part of the flow that's already been established by federal judge Aileen Cannon. As you'll recall, there was back and forth between the Department of Justice and Trump's counsel and NADA's counsel in terms of when the applicable SEPA guidelines, the Classified Information Procedures Act guidelines, and the deadlines were going to be set. We have an order. We have a trial, as you all know, in May of 2024. So how does it affect all of the timing of this? Well, that's a big question mark. Once we actually see De Oliveira arraigned and once he's actually a part of this process, I would highlight the fact that just like Walt Nauda, his charges, as in De Oliveira's charges, don't deal with the classified dockets in and of themselves. It's false statements. It's obstruction. And so at this point, I would make the argument that if I were the government, he doesn't have to be a part of this flow. However, he is a part of the trial. He is a co-defendant. So we're just going to see whether or not he's going to be a part of these deadlines that are going to be coming up. Ken, while we have you, let's talk a little bit about what we've been hearing from the former president. He's addressed the indictment during his while on the campaign trail, generally including in these fundraising emails and such, but specifically at this rally in Erie, Pennsylvania this weekend. I want to play a little bit of what he said. They waited two and a half, almost three years, so that they could bring him right in the middle of my presidential election, because it's election interference. I consider it actually a great badge of honor. I do. It's a great badge of honor because I'm being indicted for you. Ken, walk us through what we're seeing Trump do here using these indictments to rally his base. Yeah, it's a consistent playbook, right? By the way, those charges are false. The Department of Justice didn't wait. They proceeded uh, as quickly as they could, from what I can tell, according to my reporting. But look, we're 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 getting close to a situation where Donald Trump is essentially going to be campaigning on the notion that you either elect me or I could be in prison. Because if he's elected and he wins the election, no less than his former Attorney General Bill Barr has said that he expects that these criminal cases will go away. Because it's looking very unlikely that any of them are going to get to trial, despite that May trial date. 
before the November 2024 election. So the stakes could not be higher in this election, and Donald Trump is doing what he can to campaign against the legal system and against the charges against him, as many politicians have done over the years when charged in federal court. The stakes are just much, much higher this time. Ken, Katie, and Danny, thank you all so much for kicking us off this morning. And with former President Trump in the legal hot seat, some of his fellow Republican candidates are taking aim at the front runner on the campaign trail. Here's Meet the Press moderator Chuck Todd now with more on one of those candidates. Hello there, Savannah and Lindsay. This week on Meet the Press, Republican presidential candidate Will Hurd joined me to discuss why he decided to call out Donald Trump directly in Iowa on Friday. Here's what he had to say about the crowd's negative reaction was as expected. I knew there were going to be people that didn't like it, but what I didn't expect was there were a lot of people that actually clapped, and then more, there were more people that just sat there politely and probably understand and knew what I was saying was the truth. My goal was not to go in there and talk to the people that, you know, have been frustrated when, they, when they're told that the person that they respect has been lying to them. I was there to talk to the people that believe in personal responsibility, uh, that believe character matters, that believe service matters, that believes that the United States has a role in the world and it's important to us back here at home. Those were the people that I was, I was going to speak to and also to prove to the rest of the field that we're running for an election and if you're afraid to talk about Donald Trump or talk about his baggage, then you're not ready to be president of the United States. Uh, we now have 74 additional criminal charges plus that civil defamation statement from another court. None of it has mattered to Republican voters. Why? Well, I don't know why the, the part of the population that supports Donald Trump, I will say this race will tighten when we get closer to an election. That, that's what always happens in elections. Uh, the place that it is mattering is with independents and conservative Democrats that are frustrated uh, with Joe Biden. If the Republican Party puts Donald Trump forward as our nominee, we will give four more years to Joe Biden on purpose. You can see my full interview and more at meetthepress.com. You can also get more Meet the Press right here on NBC News Now every single week weekday at 4 p.m. Chuck Todd, thanks so much. Well, today, a former business partner of Hunter Biden will testify before the House Oversight Committee in a closed-door hearing. Devin Archer is expected to discuss Hunter's business dealings at the same time his lawyers are trying to keep him out of prison. For more, we are joined by NBC News reporter Gary Grimbach on Capitol Hill. Hey, Gary, good to see you. So there's a lot of moving pieces here. Let's establish the players first. Tell us who is Devin Archer and how is he related to Hunter Biden? Good morning, Savannah. Yeah, Devin Archer is by no means a household name, so you'd be forgiven if you don't know who he is. He's a longtime friend and business partner of Hunter Biden, somebody who served alongside Hunter on the Burisma board. Burisma, of course, is that Ukrainian energy company that Hunter Biden was closely associated with, while his father, then Vice President Biden, had Ukraine as part of his portfolio as VP. But Devin Archer is dealing with his own legal issues that have absolutely nothing to do with Hunter Biden. Archer was convicted back in 2018 of being involved in a conspiracy to defraud Native American tribes. House Judiciary and House Oversight want to talk to him not about that, but about the Biden family and specifically the old involvement of then involvement of Joe Biden in any of his son's foreign business dealings. Savannah. And so then walk us through also what Archer was convicted of. I mentioned his attorneys trying to keep him out of prison as well. Tell us those details. Yeah, so Devin Archer's sentencing was originally scheduled for last year, but it's been pushed back several times due to appealing. And on Thursday, a court of appeals finally said, we're denying your appeal, which means sentencing has to go mm -hmm. ahead. So DOJ over the weekend filed a note asking the judge to set a timing for that sentencing, which fired up some on the right wing and, and media and conservatives in Congress trying to connect those dots, saying there's some sort of grand conspiracy here that our reporting indicates Savannah simply doesn't exist. Devin Archer, for his part, when he arrives to Capitol Hill today for that closed-door House oversight hearing, he's expected to testify that then-VP Biden met with dozens of Hunter, Hunter's business associates, which would, of course, directly contradict the White House's repeated claim that he was, quote, never in business with his son. Savannah? Yeah, so let's tell me now, what do we expect we might hear from Archer? So he's going to talk about the idea that there are dozens and dozens of business dealings that Hunter was involved in, that Vice President Joe Biden was either involved in in person or over the phone. Of course, we heard about that uh, a few weeks ago where there was some sort of uh, a paper, perhaps, where there was a transcript of his son, uh, father being involved in some of these phone calls. But 
as it relates to this sort of grand conspiracy that conservatives are making up, their, his, uh, the attorney for Devin Archer himself doesn't agree with that speculation. His attorney says Archer will show up today and honestly answer all of the questions that are put to him by Congress. So you also know. mentioned that there was this backlash, Gary, from some conservatives about setting that date. How is Archer's legal team responding to that? So Archer's legal team is saying there's no real grand conspiracy here. This is what is happening. This House oversight subpoenaed him. Uh, uh, Comer subpoenaed him. And he's going forward with this date. He's going to show up today and speak behind closed doors. So we're not going to find out exactly what he says, but it'll all be behind closed doors. Savannah? All right. Gary Grumbach, thank you so much. Good to see you. This morning, the White House is working around the clock to free a U.S. citizen and her child who were kidnapped in Haiti. American nurse Alex Dorsanville and her child were taken on Thursday, according to the nonprofit organization she was working for. NBC News White House correspondent Ali Rafa joins us now for more on this. So tell us a little bit, Ali, about Dorsanville and the kind of work she was doing there in Haiti. Her husband was the director of the organization, right? Yeah, that's right, Lindsay. Uh, Alex is actually from New Hampshire, and she moved to Haiti after marrying uh, her husband, Sandro, in 2021. Sandro is the founder and director of this Christian nonprofit she works at as a nurse. And this is a K-12 through school, as well as a Christian ministry located on this campus outside of Haiti's capital of Port-au-Prince. And the organization actually confirmed that these two were kidnapped while serving in the community ministry. But details about the conditions or, or details around their abduction are still unclear. The nonprofit describes Alex in a statement on their website uh, as a deeply compassionate and loving person who considers Haiti her home and the Haitian people her friends and family. They say Alex has worked tirelessly as our school and community nurse to bring relief to those who are suffering as she loves and serves the people of Haiti in the name of Jesus. That organization adding uh, that they're asking for privacy and prayers at this time, Lindsay. So, Ali, what are the State Department and White House saying? What kind of efforts are being made to find them? Yeah, Lindsay, what makes this situation particularly so heartbreaking is that it is by no means rare or this, uh, you know, this is not an isolated incident. This is actually something that the State Department had warned of. And the same day that these two were kidnapped on Thursday of last week, uh, they had ordered evacuations for uh, non-emergency personnel and their families from the U.S. Embassy in Port-au-Prince. They also issued their highest level travel warning for Americans in Haiti, warnings specifically of, quote, uh, they said kidnapping is widespread and victims regularly include U.S. citizens. The State Department and White House are telling us right now that they're closely monitoring the situation. They also say they're in contact with Haitian authorities. Uh, the State Department adding uh, that they're working with interagency government departments uh, to get more information about this. And they add uh, that the safety and security of U.S. citizens abroad is their number one priority. Ali, can you elaborate on the conditions there now and the steps that the Biden administration is taking to, to help improve the deteriorating situation over there? Yeah, well, the people of Haiti have really had a string of bad luck over the last few years. They, the president, Their president was assassinated in July of 2021, and just one month later, they were hit by a devastating uh, earthquake. And because of that vacuum of leadership, the country really just collapsed into anarchy, with armed gangs now controlling an estimated 80 percent of the capital of Port-au-Prince. Uh, crime has surged amid these gang turf wars. Uh, draining police forces. It's also driving a humanitarian crisis. There's been an ongoing outbreak of uh, cholera there. These gangs, in some cases, restricting access of, of, of the Haitian people's access to water, to hospitals there. Uh, Sec Secretary of State Antony Blinken actually spoke about his concerns there uh, over the weekend. Take a listen. We have very deep concern for the situation there, particularly with uh, regard to violence, and the activities of, uh, of the gangs. We are also very focused on uh, working together with partners to uh, try to help the Haitians restore security, restore stability. We've been very focused on um, trying to uh, put in place what's necessary for a multinational force, including finding a lead nation uh, to take this on. 
And Blinken is talking about this international effort to restore order with the use of this multinational police force. But that effort had really made little progress over the last eight months until Saturday uh, when uh, the Kenyan foreign minister volunteered to take the lead on this. Uh, so we should expect other countries to, to start uh, committing resources to Haiti in the next few weeks and months, Lindsay. Okay, Ali, thank you for that reporting. Well, this morning, a large wildfire is burning out of control in the Mojave National Preserve, crossing from California into Nevada. According to the National Weather Service, that fire is currently about 70,000 acres. And just to put that into perspective, that's the equivalent of about 140 Disneylands. The flames are being fanned by high winds, with firefighters reporting flames up to 20 feet high. But because of the remote location of the fire right now, no evacuations have been ordered. With that, it is time for a check on your morning news now weather. Meteorologist Michelle Grossman joins us now for the latest. Michelle, happy Monday. Happy Monday. So good to see you guys. And we are still talking about that heat the last day of July into August. We're going to see the heat continuing better than last week. Last week, we had over 100 million people under heat alerts. This morning, we're at 39 million Americans. So it's mainly across the south. We have relief into the northern part of the nation, the Pacific Northwest, uh, the northern plains, the Great Lakes, the Ohio Valley, the Northeast, feeling really comfortable this morning. But it's the south. We're going to continue to sizzle. We're looking at uh, heat alerts stretching from the central plains into the southern plains, the Gulf Coast states, the southeast as well. Where you see that pink, that's an excessive heat warning. So Dallas, Austin, New Orleans, you're going to see temperatures into the triple digits once again, and we're going to continue to break records. So these red dots sort of indicate where we expect to break records. That's over nine states over the next few days. And that's a lot because we've been breaking records for weeks and weeks and weeks. We talked about this heat wave really for the entire month of July, and we're going to continue to do that. So we have a big area of high pressure continuing to bring in this heat. We're looking at temperatures into the triple digits in a lot of spots in the south. Dallas today, 106, 103 in Houston, San Antonio, 103. We're warm in Florida, too. Temperatures in the low to mid-90s. You factor in the humidity there that we're going to feel warmer than that. And then tomorrow, we're going to break more records. We're looking at 107 in Dallas, 100 degrees in New Orleans, 93 in Brooksville, uh, Florida, and 92 degrees in Key West. You factor in the humidity. We're going to be near 100 degrees there. But look at this. Sunny and seasonal. We had that break in the heat yesterday in the Northeast, and we're going to continue to see that streak. So New York City on Wednesday, just 81 degrees, 83 on a Thursday, 82 on Friday. And look at Boston, feeling a little fall-like on Wednesday with 75 degrees. So that's the big weather story. It continues to be. We're also looking at several chances for some storms, some showers, hot and stormy in the southwest. That's monsoonal moisture. So that could bring down some of the temperatures for a tad uh, a bit today. We're looking at a storm threat through the northern plains. That could bring some damaging winds, some hail, also some heavy downpours. And then the mid-Atlantic to the southeast could see some heavy downpours with some storms. That continues on Wednesday in Florida. Otherwise, we're looking at the lower Mississippi Valley on Wednesday with some storms and really pleasant guys still in the northeast on Wednesday before we get some rain on Friday. Back to you. All right, Michelle, thank you so much. Well, the dangerous heat we've been seeing is having an impact at the pump, too. NBC News correspondent Dana Griffin has more on the rising cost of gas. Have you noticed prices at the pump climbing? It's not a mirage, but as the country sizzles under sweltering heat, so do our wallets. I've been going to work every day watching my gas tank go down, and I've been watching the gas prices go up. Gas prices have spiked, averaging $3.75 a gallon, according to AAA. 16 cents higher than last week, but still cheaper than a year ago, with California once again approaching $5 a gallon. Experts say cuts in production are to blame, but so is the record-breaking heat. You've got a lot of refineries that are coughing and wheezing. They're not really geared to run with 10 or 15 days of 100-degree temperatures in a row. And as we move into peak hurricane season, the industry fears prices will continue to spike. When a hurricane enters into the Gulf of Mexico, supplies can be disrupted, resulting in higher gasoline and diesel prices. How is this going to impact consumers? I expect that gasoline prices are going to continue to rise another 7 to 10 cents a gallon. And that means the cost to deliver goods and services to the consumer is going to increase as well. I have to take money out of grocery to make sure I have gas to get to the store. Mm. So it's like it's like a lose-lose situation. For now, the only hope for drivers is to figure out a way to spend less time on the road until prices come back down. Dana Griffin, NBC News. 
This morning, the White House is speaking out over the growing unrest in Niger following a military coup that toppled the government. In a statement, Secretary of State Antony Blinken said the U.S. joins West African nations in calling for the immediate release of the president and his family and the restoration of all state functions. Well, this comes as thousands of protesters took to the streets yesterday and attacked the French embassy. NBC News Pentagon correspondent Courtney Kuby has the latest. As thousands took to the streets in Niger's capital, the protests turned violent. Crowds attacking the outside of the French embassy, burning a perimeter door and breaking windows, but not breaching the walls. We were driving through the capital when we saw the protests largely peaceful, with most there to show support for the Nigerian military leaders who have locked up the country's democratically elected president and claimed control. At the same time, leaders from neighboring countries held an emergency summit, demanding the release of the president or else. Such measures may include the use of force. The U.S. government has not officially called this a coup. If they did, they'd have to suspend more than $400 million in aid to Niger, as well as critical military cooperation to battle terror groups in West Africa. Nations around the world have condemned this coup, but as they cut ties with Niger, the concern is this former French colony could pivot towards Russia for its security assistance. All right, Courtney, thank you so much. More international news now. Dozens of people are dead after a suspected suicide bombing at a political rally in Pakistan. NBC News foreign correspondent Ali Aruzi joins us now with that and some other world headlines. Hey, Ali, good morning. Good morning, Savannah. Good morning, Lindsay. That's right. A suspected suicide bomber blew himself up at a political rally for an Islamic coalition party in northwest Pakistan, close to the Afghan border. Um, the police chief there told NBC News that at least 45 people have been killed and dozens more have been injured, uh, many of them under treatment at various hospitals. The death toll is expected to rise. Nobody has claimed responsibility, but authorities uh, in Pakistan say it bears all the hallmarks of an attack coordinated by ISIS-K, who believe in a stricter interpretation of Islamic principles. Uh, leaders of Israel's parliament opposition are demanding that the government freeze its judicial overhaul for 18 months if it wants to resume negotiations on a consensus formula for changes. Israel has been plagued with months of demonstrations after Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu pushed through a judicial overhaul, restricting judges from challenging certain uh, decisions made by the government. And finally, Prince William surprised members of the public by dishing out environmentally favorable burgers from a food truck in South London to highlight the work done by the winner of his annual Earthshot Prize. The box of the burger is edible, the ingredients are grown in a greenhouse, and the stove that is cooked in is designed to lower pollution, setting up the heir to the throne as the next Burger King. Those are your headlines, guys. <laughs> Good one. Burger Box King. I see what you did there. Yeah, you can eat the box, <laughs> the, the container it comes in. Try it. I mean, why not? Yeah, interesting. Oh, All right. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. WNBA star Brittany Griner is going to skip a couple of games during her team's road trip to Chicago to focus on her mental health. The Phoenix Mercury posted a message of support for Griner, saying the team will work with her on a timeline for her return. Griner is in her first season back with the Mercury after spending several months in Russian custody last year. You'll recall she was detained after vape canisters were found in her luggage at a Moscow airport. Griner was sentenced to nine years in prison before being released last December in a prisoner swap negotiated by the Biden administration. Well, it's been exactly one week since 18-year-old Bronny James, son of basketball superstar LeBron James, suffered cardiac arrest while at a college basketball practice. Well, now new light is being shed on just who can be a victim of cardiac arrest and ways to monitor for it. NBC News senior medical correspondent Dr. John Torres has more. He's known as King James, LeBron, one of the best to ever play the game. His son, Bronny, an incoming freshman at USC, hoping to follow in his father's footsteps. The 18-year-old, one of the hottest college prospects in the country. And then, this week, the 911 call every parent dreads. Listen, 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 listen. 
to be this up, okay? Get an ambulance here now. Ronnie James had suffered a sudden cardiac arrest and was rushed to the hospital. Amazingly, he was out of the ICU within a day and went to dinner with his family in Los Angeles on Friday night. On Saturday morning, his dad posted a video on Instagram of Bronny playing the piano. The frightening episode putting a spotlight on the health of school and college athletes. It's very difficult to see someone who's young and looks outwardly healthy have a sudden cardiac arrest, but it really highlights the fact that there can be underlying cardiovascular disease that goes undiagnosed. The scare came less than a year after another USC player, Vincent Iwichakwu, suffered a similar cardiac event, collapsing at practice last summer. And the world was watching when Buffalo Bills defensive back DeMar Hamlin went into cardiac arrest on the field last January after making a tackle. Hamlin tweeting his support for Bronny this week. Research has shown that basketball and football are really the two that are most associated with sudden cardiac arrest. And we do see the highest numbers of sudden cardiac arrest in male African-American basketball players. According to the American Heart Association, one in 300 young people are at risk for sudden cardiac arrest, and approximately 2,000 athletes under 25 die each year. Are those numbers underreported, do you think? Medical experts uh, believe that that is underestimated, that it's the tip of the iceberg. Martha Lopez Anderson is director of advocacy at Parent Heart Watch and lost her own son, Sean, to cardiac arrest. She now advocates for increased awareness and training around cardiac emergencies. A lot of times uh, parents assume that their school or their child's sports team is prepared. And what I can tell parents is don't assume, make sure, ask alongside increased heart screening for young people. She recommends parents also check that schools and sports facilities have accessible working AEDs or automated external defibrillators, that there is a clear cardiac emergency response plan, and that teachers, coaches, and even parents themselves know CPR. Everyone, everyone should be empowered with life-saving skills. That is the only way we're really going to change the paradigm of sudden cardiac arrest in our country. Health experts agree. They say if and when a cardiac event does occur, those first few minutes are crucial. That immediate treatment is everything. We know that bystander CPR can double or triple someone's chance of survival. Early defibrillator use, early bystander CPR can absolutely save lives. And we've seen it in the case of DeMar Hamlin and now with Bronnie James. We're going to stay on this and continue this important conversation with Dr. Matthew W. Martinez. Hi, Dr. Martinez. Thanks very much for being here. So we just heard there how crucial increased screening can be when it comes to cardiac arrest and kind of figuring out these underlying heart issues. But is that something that should happen before a young athlete, you know, even hits the field or the basketball court? I think people assume if they're young, most likely healthy. So how do you know when you should look into that? Yeah, so uh, I what I heard was that AEDs, CPR, and emergency action plans are critical. But to answer your question was, anyone with symptoms, if you have chest pressure or breathlessness when you exercise, if you feel like you're going to pass out or you actually pass out, that has to be evaluated. If you have a known family history of cardiac arrest before the the age of 50 or a known family history of a heart muscle problem or an electrical problem with your heart, those are reasons to talk to your doctor about whether or not you need additional testing to make sure that you're safe to participate in sports. So doctor, correct me if I'm wrong, it feels like we're talking about a couple different things. We're talking about somebody who might have symptoms of some um, some chest pressure mm-hmm. and then these kind of freak accidents that can happen. I mean, we, we think one in a million, of course, that's not the correct right. statistic. Uh, but what should parents know if, if you know, they have yeah. a child going into fall sports? D- does everybody just need to get their child tested? So you said it right. So there are two pieces to this. First, those that are symptomatic, and then recognizing that sudden cardiac arrest might actually be the first symptom. So those without symptoms, then what the professional societies are recommending are American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, and even the European Society of Cardiology. Is that a complete history, family history, physical exams, social history is critical to making sure athletes are are safe middle school, high school, collegiate, and of course, professional athletes all un- should go under uh, undergo that evaluation. And then additional routine testing, much more controversial and can lead to some challenges. And we've never been able to show that ECG screening alone improves 
outcomes because of the risk of false huh. positives and false negatives. And also, what about insurance covering any type of screening? Do you know if it is covered? So most of the time you're gonna do this through your healthcare provider, but a lot of the high schools will do this and the colleges will do this as part of their pre-season assessment. So it's included as part of that initial evaluation. But if not, talk to your doctor. A physical examination and assessment before uh, sports is appropriate and, and is typically covered. But remember, as we started with, it's not enough. A non-contact collapsed athlete who's unresponsive, it's all about a plan, CPR, early AED, no need for mouth to mouth. Don't look for a pulse. Just get that plan started. That's what's really going to improve outcomes. Dr. Matthew W. Martinez, really important information so for parents to keep in mind, especially as we head toward back to school. Thank you so much. We are back now with some financial news, and Disney is bringing some familiar faces back on the team to advise CEO Bob Iger. CNBC's Bertha Coombs joins us with the latest on that and other money news. Hey, Bertha, good morning. Hey, good morning, ladies. Yeah, Disney has reportedly brought back two former executives who were seen as potential successors to CEO Bob Iger during his first run as chief executive. Kevin Mayer oversaw the acquisitions of Pixar and Marvel and the launch of Disney Plus, while Tom Staggs was head of Disney's theme parks as well as chief operating officer. They've been brought on to advise Iger to deal with Disney's legacy TV business, including ESPN. Walmart, meantime, is paying more than a billion dollars to buy out more investors in one of India's biggest startups. Flipkart is an online retailer that competes directly with Amazon in India. The Wall Street Journal reports that Walmart bought the remaining shares held by hedge fund Tiger Global. Walmart has been accelerating its push into India's growing consumer market. Its local payments business launched an online retailing app earlier this year to host local stores and merchants. And Apple is promising to fix a bug in iPhones, iPads, and the iPod Touch, affecting screen time restrictions for kids. The Wall Street Journal reports that the issue impacts a function called downtime, which allows parents to remotely set hours when kids can't use their devices. Parents are finding that the scheduled times have reverted to older settings or they've been removed altogether. Apple previously said that it would fix the issue with an update to the iOS 16 in May. Uh, but they've discovered it in later releases and even the beta version of iOS 17. So that's something that parents will really want them to get a hold of. Talk yeah. to tell people, you know, you can't use your phone. Yeah, Certainly. Definitely, yeah. And it's a cool feature for sure. Bertha, thank you. Well, turning now to the growing world of artificial intelligence, it's now gaining a foothold at the nation's largest retailer. NBC News technology correspondent Jake Ward has more. Once upon a time, Jose Avila had had an incredible memory. Started, were you supposed to have memorized where everything is? Uh, yes. And great shoes. So I would have to actually take them to the items that they needed, so from one end to the store to the other. But today, an AI-powered app shows where everything is and needs to go. It's making my job much easier. Walmart is already a cost-cutting machine, and yet the company wants to be even more streamlined. Sanjay Radhakrishnan is in charge of making that happen. How can you possibly grow more efficient than you currently are? Jacob, that's where I think technology will pl uh, play a key enabling role. We are transforming our supply chain and our store operations. And as we saw in this California superstore, AI is how they plan to do it. When trucks arrive to be offloaded, AI has already organized the pallets inside. It looks disorganized to me. But if I understand correctly, AI is telling you through the phone where everything is and where it should go. Yes, we'll have to open up our camera right. and hold up our work device, and then it's gonna tell us what boxes need to go out. Sensors in every aisle spot things as small as a freezer door left open. And AI even organizes the shelves. Then we can learn and say, okay, did two facings of this do better than maybe putting another brand in there oh, or wow. another flavor in there, right? Walmart is the nation's largest private employer, and what they decide to do when it comes to efficiency sets national standards. So when they decide to adopt AI, it has implications for the whole country. And that, of course, raises a crucial question for workers. Does AI, do you think, forecast a world in which you won't need as many humans in this store? We view technology as helping our associates to evolve physically demanding jobs 
into more fulfilling, higher skilled job roles. So over time, we believe that we'll be about the same or more number of associates in the company. As a retail worker, can I sort of relax about my job in the future, do you think? No, I, uh, I don't think that you can. Experts say the number of jobs may remain the same, but people without the right skills won't get them. There are increasing uh, frictions in the workplace such that it is harder for workers to transition from one job to a new job. Avila, the store lead, says workers here are happier in the age of AI. Our headcount and our turnover is much better from two years ago. Mm. Yeah, oh. much better. Now we'll see how working in a world of low prices and high efficiency compares to shopping in one. Jake Ward, NBC News, Gilroy, California. Maybe I've been in New York too long, but that is a massive Walmart. <laughs> yeah, there, yeah, you're too wow. used to bodegas. Yeah, I know. You can fly a drone and everything <laughs> in there. All right, that was a really interesting report, though. Thank you, Jake. Well, today might be the last day of July, if you can believe that, but it doesn't mean yeah. it's too late to travel the friendly skies this summer. If you're traveling on a budget, and let's face it, who isn't, it might be a good <laughs> time to figure out how to use those frequent flyer points or credit card yeah. points for some good deals. So Katie Nastro, travel expert at Going, joins us now for more on this. Katie, good morning. I often only use my credit card points for flights. I, I don't yes. know if that's your advice. You can tell me. But it feels like we're talking about two different things. Frequent flyer miles, which you earn by purchasing Flying, fl right. flights, or credit card points, which you use by swiping your card. So or anything. which is better, and how do you know when to use one of those versus just using your credit card? Yeah. Sure. So miles are the currency that you accrue with the airline, but credit card points are the currency that you accumulate with a credit card. A lot of times people are racking up spending and accrue credit card points, which then can be transferred to miles through your mile, through your uh, loyalty program. And so there's no wrong or right, you know, should I use points? Should I use miles? It's all really the same. It's just the type of currency. So tell us then when you should use whichever one, whether it's credit card or airline points versus paying for it. I mean, do, do the points expire at some point? You know, if you have a lot racked up, is it like, okay, let's just get to it? Or is there a certain time when you're like, no, actually, it makes more sense to just pay the dollar amount. Like sometimes I do that if it's a cheaper flight, right. just because I'm like, oh, that's going to hurt less on my credit card, right. even though I had the points. But that's not really based in any facts. <laughs> that's just my feeling about things. So what do you think? It's a good feeling. You're not totally wrong. So really, you know, when you're looking to book, rewards don't really, those prices don't really fluctuate nearly as much as cash prices mm -hmm. would. So booking last minute typically isn't out, at, it typically isn't as outrageous as it would be if you were looking to buy a flight oh, outright last minute. However, award availability or how many seats are a, you're able to book with miles, that's really what you're looking for. If there's no award availability, then you can't get that ticket. So the best tip if you're looking and trying to figure out should I use cash or should I use uh, miles is, you know, start looking early about 10 to 11 months out when schedules are published, you know, people will decide maybe they don't want to take that flight and seats will open up or the airline will release more seats as well as try to calculate the value of that mile. And it's just, a, you know, a simple math equation. It's not super hard. I'm not good at math. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it's, it really can be simple. It's just, you know, the whole points, miles, it's, it's, it can be cumbersome, but it yeah. really is not. And you just, it really is subjective. You know, yeah. am I looking to get across the Atlantic super cheaply? Is using uh, miles the best way to do it? Or is that cash price a little bit easier on the wallet? It, it all depends on what, uh, what is worth it to you. You know, there might be some people who are listening who think, look, I don't fly enough to rack up miles or maybe even I don't, uh -huh. you know, I don't spend enough with a reward card to rack up points. What are some good ways to earn so so that you're you're figuring out how to best use the system? Mm -hmm. Sure. So honestly, the best way to do it to really get any type of currency is through a credit card. You know, you can passively rack up points on your everyday spend and to figure out what credit card is best. It really just you need to look at your spending habits and your lifestyle. Are you somebody that lives in a city and you pay rent and you go out to eat a lot? Maybe the built rewards card that gives you percentages back on paying rent and three times the points on going out to eat might be the best for you. It really depends on your lifestyle. But really 
really the credit card is the best way. You know, there are programs, you know, Delta and Starbucks partner, but you'd have to drink a lot of coffee for mm. it to end up getting you anything or getting you a free flight. <laughs> Yeah, and watch out for those fees, too, those credit card annual oh, gosh, fees as well. Yeah. You have to make sure that it's worth it. So, Katie, thank you so much. Great that point. was helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back. With the summer heat that so many people have been dealing with, it looks like we are not the only ones looking to cool down. In Burbank, California, <laughs> police officers responded to a peculiar trespasser at a home there, a black bear. <laughs> Did he just have his arm up? <laughs> black bear just lounging in the family's hot tub. How do you get a black bear out of a hot tub? Well, you don't. <laughs> he looks like he's <laughs> the enjoying the jet. I know, something. he's like, where's my cocktail? <laughs> the bear spent several hours on the property, eventually wandered back into the wild, but not a bad view either. Several hours <laughs> He's like, oh, this is a resort. I got the day pass. Right. Oh, my God. That's hilarious. Finally, this hour. This is a big week for Team USA at the Women's World Cup. That's right. They're taking on Portugal tomorrow in the final group stage game. And it's a make or break game. NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter has been living it up in Auckland. And she joins us now. Hi, Molly. Great to see you. So this is a big high stakes game for Team USA. How is it looking ahead of tomorrow's match? And what do they need to do in advance? Hey guys, good morning. You may hear some very loud cheers, some very loud emotion from the bar around me because right now there is an Australia-Canada game going on and a penalty was just oh. taken. <laughs> Woo! This is also a make or break, you guys, for Australia. Okay, Australia's up 4-0. Australia is one of the host nations. Real-time sports reporting. Anyways, also a make or break game for Australia. For the U.S., though, guys, there are a couple ways that they get in. They move on in Group B with a tie. They play Portugal Tuesday night our time. That is 3 a.m. your time. But when you look at Group B right now, the Netherlands, Portugal, and the U.S. right now all have the ability to move on. And those games, the U.S. and Portugal and the Netherlands at Vietnam, they play at the exact same time. So we will know after that game who moves on to the round of 16. See what I mean about living it up? <laughs> See what I mean? Tough live shot location. But, <laughs> but look, Molly, we know Megan Rapinoe, this is, this is her last World Cup. She's not a starter for the team, but she's playing a, an outsized leadership role. How important is her experience and know-how when it comes to these high-pressure games? I know you've been talking with her. What is she telling her teammates? necessarily outside right like there are 23 people on this team just because she's not a starting 11 she played in that first game she absolutely is ready to play in this tournament Vladko Antonovsky the U.S. coach knows that he can put her in as a real kind of change maker playmaker she makes things happen but I did have the chance to speak with her just about her evolving role take a listen I'll talk to you on the back side the thing that I'm most proud of is that I'm a winner um, and it takes a lot to win. It takes a lot of different people in different roles to be able to do that, and every single one of them is important, I think. So I look back at the times I've been a starter, and some of the most important people to me have been players on the bench that haven't even seen the field at all. So I think it takes all of us, and it takes all the energy and everybody doing everything they can to prepare the team to win and ultimately going out there and finishing the job. She is so generous. She is so gracious and so complimentary of the young people on this team. But looking ahead to Portugal, she calls this a pressure moment, and she lives for these moments. She says this is what the World Cup is all about, to have these kind of big moments, these high-stakes games this early on. Guys? Molly, you are just getting so many fantastic interviews out there. It's so great to hear from all of these star players. Um, I know there were also a couple other big results yesterday. We saw the host country, New Zealand, knocked out of the tournament. Colombia caused a major shock, beating Germany. Walk us through some of the other big headlines from the last couple days. Yeah, that's exactly right. The Colombia-Germany game was a huge deal. Colombia scoring in the 97th minute. And actually, this game, which you guys are hearing, which I am living right now in the background, is also a really big deal. Canada, the defending gold medalist. And you've got Australia. Look, a lot of very talented players on the Australian team, a host nation, of course. They were really, really excited. But this was going to be a very big game, and it will be a very, very big win for the host nation, uh, for one of the two host nations, I should say, uh, to win this. But one of the most exciting things you guys have 
about the 2023 World Cup, and every U.S. player is saying this, the U.S. coach is saying this, is that every game's a good game right now. Every game is competitive. This is the most competitive World Cup that there has ever been, and that is good for the sport. That is good for the World Cup. And so right now, you are not seeing these massive, like, 8-0, 7-0 blowouts. You're seeing really competitive teams every single time, which is just awesome, you guys. Fun to watch. Gotta yeah, be fun to definitely. Play. We got to re-rack that moment where Molly's like, she just made a penalty <laughs> trying to keep it together, but not all the way. That was hilarious. We need to keep that and make sure we've got that able to queue up. Minute Molly. by minute. <laughs> Molly, thank you so much. I would say enjoy yourself, but I am not concerned that you are. Great to see you. And congrats, by the way, unrelated to what you're covering now on your recent Emmy nomination. Great to see you. Thanks, Molly. Thanks, guys. <laughs> that does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Stay with us. Good morning, and thank you for joining us this Monday. I'm Savannah Sellers. And I'm Lindsay Reiser, in for Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, a key courtroom appearance this morning for a man prosecutors say was former President Trump's co-conspirator in attempting to delete security camera footage at Mar-a-Lago. It's all part of that investigation into Trump's alleged mishandling of classified documents. We've got more on the charges this property manager could face and how it's affecting the former president on the campaign trail. Also this morning on Russian soil, new attacks in Moscow over the weekend as Russia's defense ministry says Ukraine fired off multiple drones toward the city. Some of those drones were taken out by Russian forces and sent careening into commercial buildings. This morning, Ukraine is staying silent on the incident, though President Zelensky warns the war is returning to Russia. We've got the latest in a moment. Plus, an American kidnapped in Haiti, along with her child, while serving with a nonprofit organization there. How the State Department is responding this morning, plus the new safety warning for Americans who remain in that Caribbean nation. And Croc Watch, later in the hour, we're going to take you inside the latest efforts to save a Florida icon, the humble American crocodile. I'm sure there are reasons to do so. Humble. Sam will tell us. The humble. <laughs> Just, uh, <laughs> that was funny. It's going to be really cool, though. Baby yeah. crocodiles he's tracking. It's right. awesome. Baby yeah. one's yeah. cute, I guess. All <laughs> yeah. right, everybody. We're going to begin this morning, though, in Florida. And the court appearance today for Mar-a-Lago property manager Carlos de Oliveira in connection to the ongoing classified documents case. Yeah, de Oliveira was listed as one of three co-defendants named in a superseding indictment released last week by special counsel Jack Smith. According to the new indictment, de Oliveira attempted to delete video of the classified files being stored at Mar-a-Lago. It is the latest in the series of legal investigations into former President Donald Trump, and a possible indictment could be on the way from a separate investigation in Georgia. We are covering it all, and that begins with NBC News correspondent Garrett Haig. All eyes in Washington once again on the federal courthouse behind me, where grand jurors are set to reconvene tomorrow, and where another indictment of former President Donald Trump is possible as soon as this week. This as the former president's lead in the Republican primary and his legal bills continue to grow. These are ridiculous indictments. Donald Trump's legal battles in the spotlight and racking up costs. This morning, a key court appearance from a new Trump co-defendant, Mar-a-Lago property manager Carlos de Oliveira. He, along with Trump and an aide, facing federal charges related to the former president's handling of classified documents after leaving the White House. Prosecutors say Mr. Trump asked Dale Oliveira to delete security camera footage at the estate to obstruct the investigation. Mr. Trump and his aide Walt Nata pleaded not guilty to the original indictment last month. It's a great badge of honor because I'm being indicted for you. As the former president could face indictment this week over another case, his efforts to overturn the 2020 election. And it all comes at a price for Mr. Trump and his supporters. The Washington Post reporting that his political group spent more than $40 million on legal costs in the first half of 2023 to defend Trump, his advisors, and others, according to people familiar with the matter. But he remains the Republican frontrunner. Mr. Trump's fiercest Republican critic, 2024 rival Chris Christie, evoking the godfather to mock the GOP frontrunner over the classified documents case. It's pretty brazen. The, the, these guys were, were acting like the, um, uh, the Corleones with no experience. But two of Mr. Trump's Republican opponents say they're inclined to pardon him if he is convicted. 
I don't want there to be all of this division over the fact that we have a president serving years in jail over a documents trial. I would pardon him. The former president now threatening fellow Republicans who don't share his appetite for revenge against President Biden and the Justice Department. Any Republican that doesn't act on Democrat fraud should be immediately primaried and get out. Out. NBC News tracked down 44 of Donald Trump's former cabinet officials. And while some did not respond and some declined to comment, only four, four of those 44 said they would definitely support the former president in 2024. Among them, his former chief of staff, Mark Meadows. Among those who said they would not support Donald Trump, his former attorney general, Bill Barr, who when we asked what he would do if it came down to Donald Trump, uh, Joe Biden in a rematch told us, I'll jump off that bridge when I get to it. All right, Garrett Haig, thank you so much. And now let's bring in NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos here on set with us. Hey, Danny, good morning. So we know the same legal team is representing both Nada and De Oliveira in this case. Is that normal? Yes, it can happen. The problem is there cannot be a conflict of interest. So this is a, a relationship that is right. uh, likely or possibly we may see broken up as time moves on. A simple example is this. Let's say one of the co-defendants decides, I can't take the heat anymore. I just want to plead guilty. I've changed my mind. I, trial is just too scary. Well, that would be a, a great example of a case in which the lawyers need to withdraw from one of the client's representation if they're going to go forward to trial. Or if, for example, a one of the clients wants to cooperate. So, yes, you can have a joint defense like this. Yes, attorneys can represent two defendants in the same case, but it is fraught with peril because at some point there may be a conflict. So just because they may represent them now doesn't mean they'll represent them at trial. Mm. De Oliveira is also accused of making false statements to investigators, saying, for example, he never saw anything when asked whether he was involved with moving a classified materials. What does that tell you here about the charge in the case and also the evidence that prosecutors have? Well, the most telling thing now is that there is a new charge of essentially obstructing, and you have the moving boxes, you have the new co-defendant, and you have the attempt to delete security footage. So what's interesting about this to me is what information became available to the government that wasn't available to it when it initially indicted just two months mm -hmm. ago. And the other question I have is, will there be more superseding indictments? I mean, if nothing else, this superseding indictment is evidence that the investigation is still ongoing. And I I have to hmm. tell you that as it keeps rolling out, if there are more superseding indictments, that increases the possibility that this case will get moved beyond the May 24 trial date. And I'm already on record saying I am betting against May 24 or mm. the May trial date going forward. But if there are potentially more superseding indictments, doesn't that tell a judge our case isn't buttoned up? Yeah. No, it does not. Okay. And, and frankly, it's not the judge that makes that decision. It's ultimately the jury. And judges are very used to this. This happens all the time in my federal cases. Sometimes even they keep the same defendant and they add charges based on the existing known facts. So mm. superseding indictment is not that unusual at all. In fact, in many cases, you can get into like the fifth, the sixth superseding indictment. So mm. uh, you can have quite a few of these. It's, it's totally anticipated in the rules. It, if nothing else, will extend the time of the overall time to trial. While we have you, let's switch gears really quickly, talk about what's happening in Georgia, this Fulton County investigation into possible election interference. The DA there says they'll be ready to bring charges by September 1st. What do you think about that timeline and what we might see? And then also, is that normal to, to hear them say, hey, we're publicly going to put this date out there. It's hard to compare, especially the Georgia case, to a typical timeline because there's nothing that's typical about this case. Most yeah. of the time, prosecutors will just go to a grand jury and get an indictment. This is a prosecutor, for example, that went to basically what I would call an advisory grand jury before going to the grand jury grand jury. I mean, she submitted it to a grand jury that had no indictment power, that basically issued a report and now gave it back to her. Uh, the one thing I read mm -hmm. from this is that Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis wants to be perceived as having given this out to third parties to make determinations of probable cause and guilt. In other words, to, to lessen the idea that it is Fannie Willis, individual person, charging anyone if it ends up being right. the president. So there's nothing normal about this investigation. With a normal run-of-the-mill defendant, right. they just indict him. Uh, here you have someone who may end up getting indicted as a result of two separate grand juries, something that does not happen very often. Danny Savalos, we appreciate you always. Thanks so much. Thank you. A well, cleanup is underway in Moscow this morning after a series of drone attacks in the Russian capital over the weekend. While not taking responsibility, Ukrainian President Zelensky said the war is, quote, returning to Russia. NBC News chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel joins us now with the latest. Richard, good morning. 
Good morning, Lindsay. This is a space to watch. Uh, President Putin is not looking strong. Uh, the Ukrainian offensive against him is intensifying. He survived a short-lived mutiny a lot long ago. And now Moscow itself is increasingly targeted by drones. The drones exploded in the heart of Moscow's financial district on Sunday morning around 4 a.m. Russian officials say at least three drones were involved and blamed Ukraine. Russians can no longer turn a blind eye to this war now that it's coming home. Although Ukraine didn't take responsibility, President Zelensky gave what seemed to be the most direct admission of cross-border attacks into Russia yet and suggested a new chapter is beginning. Ukraine is getting stronger. Gradually, the war is returning to Russian territory, its symbolic centers and military bases. And this is an inevitable, natural and absolutely fair process, he said. The war continues to be a disaster for Russia. 523 days in, Russia seems no closer to victory than when it first invaded. The Russian army is so short of troops, it had to raise the age limit for conscripts. But you wouldn't know it listening to President Putin, who was busy celebrating Navy Day this weekend. In the name of Russia, our sailors are giving all their strength, showing true heroism and fighting valiantly, as our great ancestors did, he said. Small, explosive drones have been central to the war from the start and are now exposing Moscow's vulnerability. In May, the Kremlin itself was attacked by drones. Ukraine denied involvement at the time. But attacks are becoming more frequent. This was the fourth drone attack in or around Moscow this month. And Ukraine no longer seems concerned about hiding it. In addition to attacks inside Russia, Russian defense officials accuse Ukraine of carrying out drone attacks against the occupied Crimean Peninsula, including one which Russia says it stopped, involving a swarm of up to 25 drones. Lindsay. Richard Engel, thank you so much. Well, an American nurse and her daughter have been kidnapped in Haiti. Alex Dorsonville was working for a relief organization when she was taken, according to the nonprofit. It comes as the State Department ordered the evacuation of embassy staff and warned Americans to stay out of the country amid growing unrest there. NBC News correspondent Kristen Dahlgren joins us now from Dorsonville's hometown of Middletown, New Hampshire. Kristen, good morning. Good morning, guys. Yeah, Alex may have started in this small New Hampshire town, but those who know her say she was really drawn to a life of service, nursing children for the nonprofit that her Haitian-born husband founded. And this morning, that organization says it is doing everything it can to get her and the couple's young daughter home. This morning, American Alex Dorsonville and her young daughter Haven remain missing after reportedly being kidnapped near Haiti's capital, where she has lived for at least three years, according to the nonprofit El Roy. My name is Alex. I'm a nurse from New Hampshire, but now I live in Haiti. The 31-year-old nurse works for the faith-based organization that has a school and ministry in Haiti and is married to the organization's founder, Sandra Dorsonville. Sandro invited me to come to the school to do some nursing for some of the kids. He said that was a big need that they had. Elroy says Alex and her child were taken from their campus on Thursday, writing in a statement, we continue to work with our partners and trusted relationships to secure their safe return. Details of how they were abducted remain unclear. Alex was very compassionate and cared very much for people who had great need. Alex attended Regis College in Massachusetts, whose president is not surprised her former student chose a path of service. She was definitely um, a very special young woman. The same day the mother and daughter were taken, the U.S. State Department issued its highest level travel advisory for Haiti, warning Americans not to visit, citing crime and civil unrest, adding kidnapping is widespread and victims regularly include U.S. citizens. The State Department also recalling non-emergency personnel from Haiti's U.S. Embassy. We have very deep concern for the situation there. The United Nations estimates armed gangs control 80 percent of the nation's cities. El Roy says they are in close communication with Alex's family and are working hard to get them home. 
And so both the White House and State Department say they are aware of the reports of the kidnapping and are in frequent contact with Haitian officials. Savannah? Mm. All right, Kristen, thank you so much. Well, now let's get to the latest on the Gilgo Beach murders. This morning, we are hearing from the wife of the alleged serial killer. And she's breaking her silence for the first time since her husband was charged with the murders of more than, of three women more than a decade ago. NBC News senior national correspondent Stephanie Goss joins us now with the latest. Stephanie, good morning. Hi, guys. Good morning. Rex Sherman's wife is asking for privacy and normalcy after investigators and the public flooded the neighborhood where the couple lived for weeks. Her husband allegedly lived a double life, a family man who commuted to work in Manhattan. Prosecutors now believe he is a serial killer. Days after investigators wrapped up collecting evidence at Rex Hurman's home, his wife, Asa Ellerup, and her two adult children returned to a life they no longer recognize. It's been a very tumultuous time for them. Life has been thrown upside down in the past few weeks. The family of a Manhattan architect charged in the Gilgo Beach serial killings is now asking for privacy writing in a statement that they have endured profound and indescribable catastrophe. Herman's wife adding, I am pleading with you all to give us space so that we may regain some normalcy in our neighborhood. The streets were closed. You had to get access by police escort to get to your own home. The neighbors have been impacted just as much as she has. Some neighbors are reaching out, sending care packages and grocery deliveries. One writing, dear neighbors, we are thinking of you through this difficult time. If there's anything we can do for you, please let us know. Ellerup filed for divorce on July 19th, right after 59-year-old Hurman was arrested and charged with three counts of first-degree murder in the deaths of three women in their 20s, believed to have been sex workers over a decade ago. And he's now the main suspect in the disappearance and death of a fourth woman. We have obtained a massive amount of, of uh, material. Following a nearly two-week search of the family home, investigators say it'll take time to analyze and catalog what they found, as police in other states are also looking into potential connections to other unsolved crimes, including in Las Vegas, Nevada, where Hurman had a timeshare, and in Atlantic City, New Jersey, for possible ties to the 2006 eastbound strangler case, while his estranged wife focuses on moving on with her life. She needs to protect herself and her children at this point, not knowing what's going to happen with him. We've reached out to Rex Herman's attorneys for comment and have not heard back. Herman has pleaded not guilty. He is scheduled to appear back in court tomorrow, guys. Okay, Stephanie, thank you. You're welcome, Kim. Well, over 30 million Americans are still under heat alerts, and we're keeping an eye on some storms that could be headed your way. Sounds like a busy week. Joining us now is meteorologist Michelle Grossman. Michelle, good morning. Good morning to you both. Yeah, we're looking at a couple things today. We're looking at that heat continuing in the south. We're seeing that relief in the northern part of the nation, the northeast and mid-Atlantic uh, portions of the Great Lakes, also the Ohio Valley. But we're looking at that uh, sweltering heat still in the south. Triple digits for so many, record-breaking heat over the next couple of days. Also hot and stormy in the southwest. So we're looking at monsoon moisture into Arizona, storm threat through the northern plains. That could bring some damaging winds, also some hail. Those are the main threats. Then we're looking at scattered widespread showers hours throughout the lower Mississippi Valley to the mid-Atlantic, the southeast. Could see some heavy rain in spots there. Also portions of the interior parts of northeast into New England. So a few spots seeing some wet weather on this Monday. Then as we go throughout the middle of the work week, we're looking at pleasant conditions still in the northeast and really nice temperatures in the low 80s, upper 70s in New England along the Great Lakes. We're going to start to see it heat up a bit there. Uh, we're looking at rain still in the lower Mississippi Valley into parts of the Tennessee Valley. Below average temperatures in the Intermountain West and those record highs do continue in portions of the south. The southwest, the south central states, the Gulf Coast states into the southeast. More rain showers, some heavy rain for portions of Florida on Wednesday. Then look what happens on Friday. We have spotty showers throughout the Intermountain West, the Northern Plains, the Midwest into lots of the east. We're looking from New England into Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, Southeast. We're looking at the chance for some showers. So that's the story as we go throughout this work week. Today, 39 million Americans under a heat alert. We're looking at heat advisories. That's in the orange from the Central Plains to the Southern Plains the Gulf Coast states into the southeast and excessive heat warnings that includes Dallas, Austin, New Orleans. You're looking at temperatures once again soaring into the triple digits. And we talked about possible records 
All these little red dots indicate the possibility of breaking records over the next three states, impacting nine different states, mainly in the south central states, the southwest Gulf Coast, into the Tennessee Valley and also the southeast. And we're looking at temperatures well above normal for this time of year, even 15 degrees above what is average for this time of year. Today, 106 in Dallas, that could tie your record of 106, right near the 100 degree mark in New Orleans, Brownsville, Texas, 98 degrees. We're warm too in Florida once again in the mid 90s. You factor in the humidity, it'll feel like close to 100 degrees, if not over 100 degrees. Same story tomorrow, 107 in Dallas, 93 in Brooksville, Florida. But look at these temperatures in the Northeast and the Great Lakes. Really, really nice for this time of year as we head into August tomorrow. Boston into the mid 70s on Wednesday, and then we're near 80 degrees on Friday. So that's a heat story. We're also watching the chance for some scattered storms. We have a couple things going on. We have the western monsoon kind of kicking up, some scattered rain showers in the southwest, scattered storms throughout the northern plains, the lower Mississippi Valley, bringing the chance for some damaging winds and also some hail. And the guys were also going to watch that rain in the mid-Atlantic to the southeast today as well. Back to you both. Welcome back. This morning, as controversy is swirling around his son, President Biden is now for the first time acknowledging he has a seventh grandchild. The four-year-old is the daughter of the president's son, Hunter, who has been engaged in a long legal dispute with the girl's mother. NBC News senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell has the latest. The president's new public acceptance of a seventh grandchild he has not met reverses years of how he talks about family. I have six grandchildren. And I'm crazy about them. I got six of them. Only six Christmas stockings had been hung at the White House. But now a significant change in a written statement Friday night. Jill and I only want what is best for all of our grandchildren, including Navy. Navy Joan, who turns five in August, is the daughter born to Hunter Biden and an Arkansas woman, London Roberts, in 2018. Our son Hunter and Navy's mother, London, are working together to foster a relationship that is in the best interest of their daughter. A shift immediately noticed on the campaign trail. I welcome the president acknowledging his little granddaughter. The decision came as political pressure began to boil from Republicans' sharp jabs. Why don't you spend some time with your granddaughter in Arkansas or at least recognize her existence? To withering media scrutiny, including a New York Times column. Some Republicans remain critical. You talk okay. about family values and you talk about all of that. It's odd that he wouldn't acknowledge one of his grandchildren. Biden grandchildren have otherwise been visible in White House life and events. And by the way, that, that's my grandson, Bo, up there. His 2020 campaign featured granddaughters in a video emphasizing their closeness. Hi, Pop. I was just talking about you. Sources familiar say the timing was affected by fairly contentious legal proceedings. And the Bidens were giving Hunter and Navy's mother space and time, while family has long been part of the president's political brand. And the White House this morning is not saying whether there are any plans for the president to at some point meet his granddaughter, Navy Joan. And also we made a number of attempts to reach her mother, London Roberts, through her attorney, and we did not hear back. Of course, this comes as Hunter Biden has been involved in legal and this personal drama. He had the uh, financial settlement with Navy's mother, and he's also still under federal investigation for his misdemeanor tax charges a gun charge, and, of course, on Capitol Hill, there's a lot of scrutiny of his business dealings. So it has been a turbulent time for Hunter Biden, and now the family is, at least publicly, embracing his youngest daughter. Okay. Savannah? Kelly, thank you. Thanks, Kelly. International headlines now. A deadly typhoon is forcing thousands to evacuate from Beijing. NBC News foreign correspondent Ali Ruzi is back with that in other world news. Ali, good morning. Good morning, Lindsay. Good morning, Savannah. That's right, a massive typhoon has brought heavy rain and flooding to Beijing. It's the strongest storm to hit China in years and has claimed the lives of at least two people so far while, tri while triggering severe floods that have caused more than 30,000 people to be evacuated from their homes. While the typhoon appears to be tapering off, another one is expected to batter China's densely populated coast this week. 
And Denmark is considering banning protests involving the, the Quran or other religious texts over diplomatic and security fears, while at the same time trying to protect freedom of speech. Copenhagen is looking at means at uh, intervening in some circumstances as they fear the protests may inspire a terror attack and that they ta tarnish the country's reputation. And finally, in Venezuela, more than 150 dogs are participating alongside their owners in a two and a half mile race through Caracas to try and raise money for animals shelters in the country. Under Venezuela's prolonged economical collapse, many have uh, left their pets in shelters or abandoned them. The money raised from the run is aiming to give animals a better quality of life before they're adopted. And those are your international headlines, guys. Oh, Very good girls and boys there. Yes, and what a great excuse to just show cute dog video. <laughs> Allie, thank you so much. We are back with the latest on that health scare for Bronny James. His dad, NBA superstar LeBron James, shared an update on how his son is doing after suffering cardiac arrest. NBC News contributing correspondent Kaylee Hartung breaks down what doctors are calling good news for the promising young athlete. Hey there, it was just one week ago that Bronny James suddenly collapsed during basketball practice at USC. Now we are learning more about the chaotic scene that unfolded on the court and seeing positive signs of his recovery. It's one of the most hopeful signs of recovery for Bronny James since suffering a cardiac arrest. We have many talents. On Saturday, LeBron James posting a short video of his son playing the piano, writing, God is great. Bronny, you are amazing. We're here right with you every step of the way. Ron, how is your son doing? Just hours earlier, the James family was seen leaving dinner in Los Angeles. Bronny appearing healthy and walking just steps behind his father. It was Bronny's first public outing since his medical emergency less than a week earlier. Your ambulance here now. Last Monday, the 18-year-old collapsed during basketball practice at USC. A 911 call conveying a frantic scene. You're on scene with them or a registered nurse? No, there's no doctor. Okay, help is already on. Help is already on the way. Okay. Though he was admitted to the ICU, his cardiologist says the swift and effective response by the USC Athletics medical staff successfully treated James, who arrived at the hospital fully conscious, neurologically intact, and stable. He was discharged just three days later. Dr. Gordon Tomaselli, who did not treat James, says his rapid rebound indicates he was likely able to get CPR and defibrillated almost immediately. His prompt response and recovery really speaks to the fact that he got treated literally within minutes and probably even within tens of seconds. Bronny James' incident is spotlighting harrowing statistics. Sudden cardiac arrest is the leading cause of death for student athletes, and the chances of survival decrease between 7 and 10 percent every minute CPR is delayed. Yet only seven states require high school athletic venues to have an emergency action plan, CPR training for coaches, and a defibrillator within one to three minutes of a venue where practices or games are held. For James, the chances of a full recovery and his return to the court are still unknown, as doctors look to pinpoint what caused his heart to stop. Still, his family outing this weekend, a hopeful sign for the promising young athlete. And as kids head back to school, parents will want to make sure their school is well equipped for an emergency, whether your child plays sports or not. Ask their school if an AED is accessible on campus and if their teachers or coaches are trained in CPR. And keep in mind, Congress is even getting involved. They're considering a bipartisan bill that would give schools grant money to buy and maintain defibrillators and provide training to students and staff. Bill Safety DeMar Hamlin is firmly backing that potentially life-saving legislation. Back to you. All right, good tips for parents there too. Kaylee, thank you so much. Now the latest on the growing number of shark sightings nationwide this summer. The Florida coast has seen several sightings and a drone recently captured a close call with an aggressive bull shark. NBC News correspondent and News Now anchor Gotti Schwartz joins us with more on this. Hi Gotti, good morning. Hey, good morning, Savannah. Yeah, this was kind of like that famous scene in Jaws where the shark comes flying out of the water, lands on the boat, only this time the boat was big enough and this time no one was hurt. This stunning scene happening off the coast of South Florida, a bull shark repeatedly launching itself at a fisherman's boat. And all of a sudden something switched in the shark's brain and he just went into full attack mode. Video producer and fishing guy Josh Jorgensen had been following a school of fish with his drone when he caught the shark battering his friend's boat. And he just went, I, 
completely nuts and just started attacking the engines and just ripping them to pieces. Fishing boat captain Carl Torreson said he couldn't believe how much damage the shark caused. I didn't think a shark could actually shake the boat like that. I'm like, are you kidding me? This is like a ride from Universal Studios. Ah! In May, a similar incident captured off the coast of Oahu. Tiger shark ran me. Kayak fisherman Scott Haraguchi rammed by a 10 to 12 foot tiger shark. It's miraculous that I didn't get knocked over. While in Florida, the shark bite capital of the nation, a recent string of attacks leading to alerts and beach closures. Looks like we got a hammerhead shark. A 12 year old girl bitten on the leg while swimming at Cocoa Beach. It hurts like incredibly bad. It was really, really painful and I just wasn't expecting it. But unprovoked shark attacks are rare and fatalities even more so. Researchers at Cal State Long Beach spent two years filming California beaches where great whites hang out and learn they come close to swimmers and surfers almost daily without humans even knowing. I think most people's conception of what a shark, a white shark is, is that if you see it in the water, it's gonna bite you. And I think one of the things our study showed is that's simply not true. Even bull sharks known to be more aggressive don't usually charge like this. When they do, it can look like something out of the movies. I know this sounds insane, but that scene in Jaws where it jumps on the back of the boat, that is totally possible. You, like you said, Gotti, <laughs> they had a big enough boat, though. All right, so we know we you just mentioned it in your piece, and it is rare, but yeah. we are talking about this a lot, so just give us some tips. Even if a shark might not attack, what do you do if you see one near you? If you see one near you, you're supposed to lock eyes at it. You can uh, you can tell that the shark can see you too, and so you want to make sure that you're swiveling your head towards the direction that the shark is. They have yeah. incredible eyesight, and then if it gets too close, you're supposed to bop one on the nose. A lot <laughs> easier said than done. Uh, we have started to see a steady rise in shark attacks and sightings since a low point way back in the 1970s, 1980s, but a lot of experts are saying that may be because of conservation, more people living near the coastlines. Uh, and uh, fortunately, alert systems and ways to monitor sharks are also getting way better with a lot of technology. So the odds of being attacked by a shark is still like 3.75, uh, one in 3.75 million. So very low, but still, after watching all of that, you're like, yeah. Well, I, I think the odds of me today. remembering to punch it in the face are even lower than that, that I'd be <laughs> encountering one myself. But, Black eyes first. Yeah. <laughs> Gotti, thank you. Good to see you. Sure. <laughs> Welcome back. If you've checked your bank account lately, you probably noticed that you're paying more for just about all of your streaming services. It's getting expensive. YouTube and Spotify are just the latest to join the wave of companies bumping up their subscription prices. NBC News correspondent Jesse Kirsch has more on this and some tips on how you can save. If you pay for music with premium Spotify, all YouTube, no interruptions or your videos on YouTube Premium, your monthly bills are going up. But while small increases might not sound big, with so many services raising prices, the costs add up. We use Netflix, Hulu, Paramount, Peacock. Meet Casey Woods. HBO Max, Stars. A New York mother of three mm -hmm. who says she's paying up to $200 every month. Apple Music, and it's just, the list goes on and on. Just for streaming services. They go up incrementally, so they think you don't notice. The Wall Street Journal calls it subscription price creep. Look at Netflix, for example, over time. The standard monthly plan nearly doubling in price over the last decade. And cutting back might be tough, since hit shows are... Dearest gentle reader. ...are not all on the same platforms. There's blood in the water. Sharks are coming. Especially with a 21, 15, and 12 year old all liking something different. I think about canceling my services almost daily, like when I look at how much money is coming out of my bank account. But then I, my children love the shows that they get to watch, and there's shows that I watch that I am not ready to cancel. For people ready to cut back, one expert says cancel and restart your subscriptions based on when your favorite shows are on. Look for deals around the holidays and use apps to help track your spending. You need to start to look at just yourself. Take this small. What am I paying per month? Is that reasonable? Do I need everything? Is it a need or is it a want? Perhaps helping you spend more time focused on your favorite shows instead of your bank account. Jesse Kirsch, NBC News.
We're all feeling it. All right, more oh, yeah. financial news now. According to the Teamsters Union, the trucking company Yellow is closing up shop. CNBC's Bertha Coombs is back with us with that and other news. Hey, Bertha. Hey, guys. Yeah, it's been a, a, a roller coaster ride. The Teamsters Union says now that Yellow has notified the, the notified the union that the trucking company has shut down and is filing for bankruptcy. Yellow has yet to comment on that news. Earlier this month, it averted a threatened strike by the Teamsters. Yellow was the nation's third largest trucker, specializing in less than truckload segment. That means combining shipments from different customers in the same trailer. Customers include large retailers like Walmart and Home Depot. Meantime, China's manufacturing activity fell for a fourth straight month in July. Official government surveys also showing the services and construction sectors are on the brink of contraction, threatening growth prospects in the third quarter of this year. China's top leaders have pledged to step up support for the world's second largest economy, focusing on expanding domestic demand and boosting consumer business confidence. And if you're looking to retire, apparently Iowa is the best place to go. A new survey from Bankrate finds the Hawkeye State ranks high in areas such as affordability, cost of living, crime levels, and the quality and cost of health care that bumped out Florida for the, from the top spot this year. It's followed by Delaware, West Virginia, Missouri, and Mississippi, all in the top five. Affordability, a key issue here. Bankrate says that states that usually top the list and are favorites, like Florida, Georgia, and Arizona, have seen the cost of living rise dramatically, and housing markets there are so competitive, it's unaffordable for a lot of folks, especially on a fixed income. But you know, guys, you know, when you retire, I, I went through this with my mom, you have to think about well, are you going to be close to family? You also yeah. want to be someplace where you have friends because it can get lonely if you don't have yeah. a social network when you retire. Yeah, community so that's just one of the is things to think about too, for yeah. sure. And according to our file yeah. footage, there, water aquatic aerobics. sports <laughs> also Thank big. You. Thank you, Bertha. <laughs> Thanks, Bertha. All right, the textile art of crochet has been around since the early 19th century, but now since the pandemic, Gen Z is grabbing their own yarn and they're calling it their hashtag grandma era. NBC News reporter Maya Eaglin picked up a needle and hook for a peek at this crochet revolution. Online, you could say Gen Z is hooked on a craft some might typically associate with older generations, crochet. I was so excited when I figured out how to do it. The hashtag crochet has been viewed nearly 22 billion times on TikTok with the rise of the granny core trend. It's being embraced by celebrities like Harry Styles and Olympians like Tom Daly, who at the Tokyo Games watch meets with needles and yarn in hand. Now it's turned profitable for some young people like 27-year-old Jada Zabala and 25-year-old Emma Ujifusa, who actually met through the online crochet community. Yeah, we didn't actually talk until we planned to meet each other in person. But you guys clicked. Yeah, yeah. instantly. Yeah. Once serial hobbyists, they're now dedicated entrepreneurs, making a living by selling their own patterns and pieces online, like Emma's famous fire sweater or Jada's popular pillow cozy. In the pandemic, I had gotten laid off so my first thing was, you know, how can I find a hobby that I can kind of monetize? Experts suggest the trend might have been fueled by the COVID-19 lockdown. In the first year of the pandemic, around six in 10 Americans took on a new hobby and nearly half earned money from it. Anxiety went way up, particularly for young people. The ability to socialize, of course, went way down. And that combination made it really ripe for this age group to take up crafts. People can create businesses now online right, and get visibility that they couldn't before so people can really make businesses where they would have no exposure. An age-old craft historically used to make items like gloves or doilies now given new life by Gen Z, using crochet for prom dresses, bucket hats, and statement pieces. What advice would you give someone if they wanted to dabble in this or start their own business? My advice is always just to like do it. Click on a video or reach out to someone you know who crochets. Taking that advice to heart, I tried it out, stepping into the grandma era trend and trying to crochet a granny square. Yeah. Attempting it once. Grab that yarn mm -hmm. and pull it through the hole. Twice. And you remember how many is in the corner? Girl, no. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe three times. Chain two? No, not yet. Not yet. Oh. Before finally. Yeah, and all the way through. It. And that's a knot. Cute. You did your first granny square. It looks square. so good.
because there's so much functionality and because you can do so much with crochet, I think it's always going to exist and be around in some sort of form. Maya Eaglin, NBC News. Good to have you back with us. For all those sky watchers, get ready for a spectacular nighttime show next month. August will see not one, but two super moons. Those are full moons that are closer than normal. The first is actually tomorrow night. It's also known as the Super Sturgeon Moon. The moon will be just a mere 222,000 miles away, give or take a few. And then the second full moon of the month will be on August 30th. When that happens, it's called a blue moon. While blue moons happen every three years, the next time we'll see two super moons in the same month will be 2037. It's exciting. a good month for you if you're into that. <laughs> it's probably too late for me to stay up to see, <laughs> yeah, but it's probably. beautiful. Yeah. All right, this morning we're learning more about how one organization in Florida is helping save endangered species. Established in 1980, the Crocodile Lake National Wildlife Refuge in Key Largo helps to protect and preserve the threatened American crocodile population. Well, lucky for us, NBC News correspondent Sam Brock is live from Key Largo, Florida with an exclusive look at what's being done to help save the reptiles. Sam, good morning. Yeah, Lindsay, Savannah, good morning. It makes my heart smile to know this is one of Savannah's favorite stories today. Why would it not be? And you mentioned a second ago, 1980 until 2007. It took 27 years to get the American crocodile off of the endangered species list. But as you mentioned, it is still threatened. But thanks to the hard work for so many biologists here, they've been able to turn back the tide, bringing the population from under 100 guys to thousands. But this is still a very fragile process as I'm sitting in the middle of a mangrove forest right now, the Crocodile Highway where the crocodiles go to drop off their hatchlings. We know that there is sea level rise and erosion that is still eating away at this habitat, meaning that this space right here is critical for crocs. Over a sprawling 6,500 acres on Florida's Key Largo, the Crocodile Lake National Wildlife Refuge might not be teeming with the tropical-based reptiles, but they're far more plentiful than just a few decades ago and trending in the right direction. What kind of a difference have these efforts made in resurrecting the American crocodile population? So we went from a population of around 70 individuals to um, about 2,500 adults. American crocodiles are native to a large stretch of land from Florida to the Caribbean, Mexico, Central and South America, and they were fighting extinction. Until pioneers here sealed off this refuge, the only one of its kind in the country, set up some sand berms, and let nature take its course. Crocodiles will actually seek out these higher elevation areas and use them for nesting. Jeremy Dixon oversees the refuge, the only full-time employee, though he has lots of helping hands, including the mama crocodile. You can see she's moved out all the sand. They'll actually have to know that the crocodiles are ready to hatch, and they'll dig them up and carry them in their mouth so to what's the your water. <laughs> I provide the nesting material for them, yes. In reality, it's a pretty detailed scientific strategy with so-called croc docs, like Sergio Balaguerra Reina using broken shells as clues to find hatchlings that require a little bit of intuition and lots of listening to locate. How does the mama crocodile know when the hatchlings are ready and what does she do? The hatchlings start peeping, so they start doing a particular sound. It's like. So the mama will hear That's that a signal. Sound. Exactly. Hey, little guy. The same signal ricochets through the refuge as the croc technicians enter the water looking for hatchlings. There's number two. Of the 30 to 35 eggs in each nest, there's no saying how many in the crocodile clutch will survive. As Sergio and the team round up the cute little critters. How long will these like crocodiles say hand-sized for? So in a year, they will duplicate their size. Who can live for up to 70 years, growing as much as 15 feet in size and weighing thousands of pounds, though many are hundreds. So right now, we will just count how many we got. Six, seven, eight. The gathering then leads to some good old-fashioned measurements, noting the length of the hatchlings. It's 12.3 centimeters, snout to vent. And their weight before the last step, claiming a little clip of the tail called a scute to keep track of the reptile's growth. The part he's cutting off for oh. DNA analysis. The exercise helps to catalog a species that's still fragile. How many hatchlings did you end up finding? We got 17 tonight from this nest. 
So 17 hatchlings going back into the crocodile population. The reptile serves a critical role in balancing the ecosystem by controlling the population of other species as they now continue to grow and thrive under the care of a crocodile team keeping close tabs on where they surface next. And I did ask if not for these sand dunes or berms, where would the crocodiles be hatching? And the answer that I was mm. told, homes, hotels, and private beaches, guys. Not exactly where you would want to find baby crocodiles, so something to keep in mind. We are so glad, of course, the population is thriving. Also, this is the key gear that you need if you're going to come out here to do crocodile hatchlings because it is about 95 degrees. The bugs are everywhere. Somehow, I got eaten alive with this thing on. The technicians, <laughs> as you saw by moonlight, were just sitting there counting crocodiles. They were fine, but I walked away with, like, a couple hundred mosquito bites. So... What are you going to do? An amazing that's experience, awesome. though. Glad I got My to see you. My grandma used to always say, that's because you're sweet. <laughs> exactly. So sweet, Sam. No, I that was, was cool, though. That. <laughs> yeah, wow. Who I wouldn't have thought I would yeah, be calling the crocodile cute. Yeah, yeah great work. story. The humble American crocodile. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we are going to end this hour with a few twists and turns. Vacation season is in full swing, and people are traveling far and wide for a different kind of trip. Yeah, this is kind of interesting. Tourists are hopping on a new trend by getting lost in some of the world's most famous mazes. NBC News foreign correspondent Kelly Kobaya even joined in on the challenge. Take a look. Guys, good morning. Well, some people are basing their entire vacations around finding their way through the confusing twists and turns of these life-size puzzles, some of them centuries old. I think I'll try this way. From the grand old gardens in England, to the ancient catacombs below Paris, to the emerald oasis in Singapore's airport. It seems every city has a maze. And a flood of visitors. So we're just walking in circles so far. We've reached the same spot multiple times. Yeah. Dead end, right? Oh no, that's a dead end. Who will pay to get lost? Ah! What is that? How am I supposed to go? No one understands the allure better than Adrian Fisher, known as the master of mazes. He's designed them for British gardens, American cornfields, even on a skyscraper in Dubai. More than 700 mazes in 43 countries on six continents of all sizes and shapes with one goal. Yes, it, it's, um, it's like a game of chess, except I have to pay all my moves first. I want you to win just before you've had enough and then you feel very good about yourself. Fisher even helped start the maze craze in the US, designing what he says was the world's first corn maze in Lebanon, Pennsylvania, at the time, the biggest in the world, but not for long. The biggest one I ever did was a corn maze in southern England, which was 19 acres and nine and a half miles of paths. Nine and a half miles of paths. Mm. And 60% of the people who went in solved the whole thing. They, what happened to the they other They were 40? determined to do it. <laughs> if you're really desperate, you know, who can wave for help. They can be terrifying, like in The Shining. Periculum! And magical in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Mazes have been part of human culture for centuries. It's in our genes. It's a painful experience at the moment, but we know at the end, if we're able to solve the maze, we get a pleasure or a doping spike or a pleasure sensation. And that's what keeps us going back to something like that. Fisher has another explanation. You're getting back to the eternal truths of families and relationships and you leave your telephones and you go and do something together. With that in mind, I set off to solve my very first maze in Fisher's backyard. What I really need is your view. Any maze master worth their medal will tell you using a drone is cheating. Oh, that's not good. After a few wrong turns. Oh, what was that? The reward, a gorgeous oh. view. And as the sun sets, the relief of knowing I won't be lost here all night. This maze only took me a couple of minutes, but closer to home, there's the Great Vermont Corn Maze, described as 24 acres of corn fusion. And if you try it, 
be prepared to be lost for at least two to three hours. Kai. Oof. All right. Confusion. Kelly, thank you. Well, that does it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.